you like and wish to be alerted every time we release a new episode, please subscribe and like us. Thank you very much for following us. We are already broadcasting. Hi, hello everyone. Hello. 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 hello Thank you for joining us. Yeah, no worries. Hello. Nice to meet you, Boltram. Likewise, Simon. Please meet you. Uh, Paolo, bene? Tutto posto? Sì, sì, tutto ok. So, here we are. Today we are talking about uh, whale ship strikes, conservation initiatives and the whale safe project. And uh, with us we have uh, Roberto Lombardi of our team. He is a marine biologist. He's uh, following the specific uh, uh, whale safe project. And uh, Simone Panigada is president at uh, TETIS NGO and Research Institute. Uh, Mr. Wolfram, Captain Wolfram Guntermann, Director of Regulatory Affairs of Hapag Lloyd. And, uh, and I am Paolo Bray, and the founder and director of Friend of the Sea and the World Sustainability Organization. Uh, I uh, announce also the next webinar, which is actually going to be tomorrow, and it's going to be some, about something completely different. It's going to be at 3 p.m. Central Europe time, and it's going to be about sustainable and ethical fashion. So we have the uh, Milan Fashion Week uh, approaching uh, next week, and uh, we have some activities going as well on that. And uh, you're welcome to participate. All our webinars are uh, free of charge and free open access. So just uh, one slide about uh, who we are. We are the World Sustainability Organization and now also Foundation. Uh, we have developed uh, two major programs stemming from my experience on the Dolphin Safe Tuna project of the Earth Island Institute, uh, Friend of the Sea, which is both uh, a standard for certifications of uh, products which respect the marine habitat, as well as groups of conservation and awareness uh, programs uh, for the protection of endangered marine and aquatic species and aquatic habitats as well as uh, we have developed a friend of the earth which is a standard for certifications of product uh, mainly from sustainable agriculture and farming even though now we are expanding the focus also to other uh, areas of production and to award our deserving companies and uh, it is also a group uh, it also represents a group of conservation projects and campaigns there's over 1000 companies more than 100 countries worldwide, which have Friend of the Sea or Friend of the Earth or Dolphin Safe certified products. So here is the website with all the information. So now I pass the word over to Roberto Lombardi. Hopefully uh, I, I will just uh, uh, stop my presentation so that uh, Roberto can uh, actually use his own uh, PowerPoint that will be more fluid. Again, okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Paolo. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, my name is Roberto Lombardi. I'm a marine biologist uh, and I'm managing the Friend of the Sea Save the Waste Conservation Campaign since 2020. And today I would like to do just a short introduction about waste, waste biology, species, the status and the threats. So this is just an introduction for people who don't know this topic and later we will go to the main topic of the webinar, so the ship strikes and the, and the waste safe award. So going to the waste biology and species very quickly, uh, let's say that whales, dolphin and porpoises are a group of marine mammals collectively known as cetacean. Scientists estimate that there are approximately 92 species of cetacean and they, are, they can be divided into two suborders. Mysticids or balen species, an example here on the left, an humpback whale, and odontocyte or toothed whales, an example on the, on the right, we have a sperm whale. This is the largest toothed whale. Going deeper to the suborders, we can see that there are some differences. Um, approximately there are 15 baleen whale species and different species of whale vary drastically in terms of size and weight. Um, baleen whales are generally larger than toothed whales. Uh, here we have an example of the blue whale, the Balaenoptera musculus. This is the largest animal ever to live on the planet. 
And these pieces can reach 30 meters in length and, and 150 tons in weight. So it's a huge animal. Another important aspect for this kind of suborder, for this suborder, is that they um, are generally known for a, a long migration, breeding in warm equatorial waters during the winter time and feeding in polar waters during the, the summer. An example is uh, the humpback whale. On, the, on the, the picture on the right, the humper whale is a, a, a species that live in all the oceans, but they travel great distances every year. For example, there are some population that can swim more than 5,000 miles from tropical breeding grounds to colder, but also more productive feeding grounds. Let's say that the most important difference between the two suborders is um, the presence of baleen or teeth. Baleen, uh, as you can imagine, uh, baleen whales have noted they have uh, uh, they are filter feed filter feeder. They feed they feed uh, small marine uh, organisms such as uh, krill, and they use uh, uh, these fringed plates of baleen. A picture on the left uh, is uh, is um, in the tail. Um, this kind of the baleen are like our hairs. They are made of a protein called uh, keratin. Here you can see the list summarized of all suborder of mysticids. They are, as I said, 15, and they are divided into different families. As you can see, there are scientific and the common name. Then the second suborder is the odontocytes. There are approximately 77 species of toothed cetacean, and they include uh, killer whales, all species of dolphins, and the porpoises, and the sperm whale, that is the only toothed species of large whale. The, the sperm whale, the Physester macrocephalus, is the largest uh, toothed whale, and it can reach up to 20 meters in length and 60 tons in weight. So also odontocytes have huge weights. Um, the many and the various species of toothed cetaceans have less uniform patterns of behavior uh, compared to the baleen whales. The vast majority live in the oceans, but there are also some species of dolphin, for example, that live in rivers and estuaries. Um, as I said before, the, the, the main difference between the two suborders is that uh, toothed whales, as you can imagine from the name, as uh, they have teeth and not baleen. So this is again the, the, the list of the suborder of odontocyte. As you can see, there are many, many species in this suborder. There are 77 species. And uh, now I want to do just an introduction about the status of whales and the threats. So the International Whaling Commission, that is the body responsible for management of whaling and the conservation of, of whales, assesses, assesses cetacean status by population rather than by species. And this is very important because the majority of species exist in several different areas and groups. Within a single species, there may be one population that can be considered close to extinction, for example, and, one other, and another one that is believed to be thriving. A good example is the North Pacific gray whale that is considered healthy in the Western North uh, Pacific, but it is endangered in the East side. Uh, a total of 92 cetacean species and an additional 40 subspecies or subpopulation, as I said, have been evaluated for the UCN red list. Here you can see the categories and the number of species or, uh, and subspecies of population. In the critically endangered category, we find uh, five species and 19 subspecies and subpopulation. I want just to focus on this first category. And uh, here I, show, I, I want to show you the, the, the three critically endangered cetaceans that are listed in the UCN red list. First of all, the Yangtze River dolphin. Then we have the vaquita, is a very small cetacean that lives in the Gulf of California in Mexico. The Atlantic upback dolphins in the west coast of Africa. The North Atlantic right whale, the Ubalina glacialis, and uh, as you can, as as we will see on the next slide, there are very few individuals for this uh, um, for this species. And the last one is the newly described rice whale. Here we have uh, a graphic which is uh, showing the number of individuals per species. As you can see here on the top, the right whale is uh, one of the most endangered uh, species. The North Atlantic right whale has less than 1,000 individuals, more or less 500, 800 species. And in the west side, the population is around 400, 300 individuals. So very few uh, animals for this species. 
There are several threats to whales and dolphins. Overall, the major, major threats to cetacean are often the result of either direct or indirect human activities. Uh, for example, we have the, the, the whaling, the entanglement of fishing gear or bycatch, the climate change, the ship strikes, this is the topic of the webinar, the toxic contamination and pollution, and it also includes the noise pollution, so the underwater noise, and the habitat degradation. I want just to focus a few of them. Uh, first of all, the commercial fishing industry is a much greater threat to whale population than the direct whaling harvesting. So there is an estimation of 300,000 cetaceans that uh, are accidentally caught each year as a bycatch, trapped in the fishing gear of large commercial fishing vessels. Pollution is another big problem for whales. It is uh, the most direct example of habitat degradation, not only for the ecosystem, for the ecosystems, but also for the whales' health. And contaminants can originate from coastal, uh, coastal lands, from boat traffic, from cities, from human products and waste, and also for tourism. And the ocean are often the final destination of many contaminants. Whales can ingest can become entangled in large uh, marine debris such as glass, plastic, or even fishing gear. There is not just this kind of pollution, but we have also the noise pollution, so the anthropogenic sound. This is another threat for whales. This is important because whales heavily depend on sound for many activities, such as foraging, migration, reproduction. So as you can imagine, noise pollution is a huge problem for these species. The last one, the, the, the boat traffic and the ship strikes is the, the main topic of today. Um, from fishing vessel and the industrial shipping is all increasing year by year. And this is a bad news for waste because this is a problem not only for uh, the, the anthropogenic noise pollution, but for ship strikes. Ship strikes uh, is a problem because it can injure or even kill whales. And there is a study that estimates uh, uh, that in the United States, west coast only the west coast of the united states approximately 80 whales are killed every year so ship strikes is a real is a real problem but uh, it's also important to say that um, these events are rarely reported and mortality estimates are likely underestimates so with this last information i would like to give the word uh, to the next uh, to the next speaker i think simone panigada and uh, thank you very much uh, for listening and for your attention. Uh, I think uh, Simone can introduce and uh, update also on his role and everything. And uh, I welcome him. It's very nice to collaborate with your uh, prestigious organization, TETIS. So uh, please feel free to start your presentation. Thank you, Simone. And thank you, Roberto, for your presentation. Thank you, Paolo. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, the presentation and the introduction. That was very, very helpful. I'm going to briefly describe uh, ship strike risk uh, in uh, the Mediterranean Sea, and I will mainly focus on uh, fin whales. I chair the Tetis Research Institute, which is an institute which has been uh, running uh, conservation uh, projects and research projects in the Mediterranean Sea since 1986, so we just uh, turned uh, 35 years old, which for a small NGO, it's quite a, a, good, a good age. So this first slide uh, shows uh, the first uh, reported collision, which goes back, dates back uh, to 1890s. Uh, and uh, on the left, uh, in the vertical axis, uh, you see the speed uh, in knots. As soon as ships started reaching a speed of about 14, 15 knots, we recorded the first ship strike. So this is a clear indication how speed of a ship is really affecting the ship strike list risk. And this is, of course, not very positive because, as we all know, ships are always willing to go faster and faster to save time and to deliver their goods or their passengers from place A to place to place B. This is another picture that shows uh, the number of uh, lethal or severe injuries in red and the minor injuries in blue sorted by speed. So again, on the left in the vertical, you see speed from zero to, sorry, you see numbers from zero to 12 in this case. And on the 
horizontal axis, you see the number of speed of knots reached by every boat. And as you can see, the red starts becoming quite important at 13, 15 knots, and the blue decreases from that. This means that above 10 knots, most of the injuries are lethal, and below 10 knots, most of the injuries are non-lethal, and they are in the light blue, as you can see on this, on this slide. The Mediterranean is a, is a sea characterized by high traffic. They estimated about 30% of the traffic in the world passes by the Mediterranean Sea. About 20-25% of oil sea burn traffic, these are big tankers crossing the Mediterranean on a regular basis. More than 200,000 merchant vessels, over 100 tons annually cross the Mediterranean. We have about 1 million cruise tourists per year, more than 480 ports, and uh, narrow and congested passageways. Uh, the only access to the Mediterranean is the Gibraltar Strait, uh, the Turkish Straits, uh, which goes into the Black Sea, and the Suez Canal, which goes into the, the Red Sea. So a very large sea with a lot of traffic and very narrow passages to enter and uh, to leave. Just to give you an idea of the traffic, these are the major tanker routes. So these are not ships, it's just the route that the tanker would do when crossing the Mediterranean. These are non-tanker routes. They can be cargoes and other kind of, uh, of ships. You see some details in the center of the slide, container, dry cargo, raw, raw packs, and others. And also the Mediterranean is uh, used by cruise ships. Uh, we all know about the beautiful landscape and the beautiful places in the Mediterranean. So there are many, many cruise ships uh, that uh, frequent uh, and use the Mediterranean on uh, a regular basis. If we go on uh, a website uh, that actually provides you the actual uh, tracks uh, of uh, ships uh, within the Mediterranean, which is a uh, marine maritime traffic, you can see how the situation is uh, in a yearly basis. Uh, the red means uh, very high concentration of uh, trucks, uh, and the green are less uh, dense and less uh, concentrated. As you can see, there is virtually not a single area in the Mediterranean which has not been covered by ship during one year. Now imagine you are a whale, a sperm whale or a fin whale, trying to look for food and try to rest or maybe give birth to your uh, to your uh, babies. And you have to face uh, this uh, huge risk of being hit by a whale, all, by a ship, almost on a, on a regular basis, on a 24 hours per day basis, I would say. The main topic of my, my talk is the fin whale. It's the second the largest animal ever living on the planet. It, can reach up to 20, 22 meters, uh, more than 90 tons in, uh, in weight. And in the Mediterranean, we have an isolated population, which is genetically separated by the North Atlantic. It's not a subspecies. It may become so in, uh, in the future, but it has uh, different habits and different genes compared to the North Atlantic. So once uh, we create a problem to this population, we will not be able to recover it because there are no other population like this one in, uh, in the world. And uh, there are several threats, uh, as uh, it was uh, presented uh, before today, maritime traffic, fishing, uh, seismic exploration, habitat de degradation, climate change, uh, of course, uh, chemical pollution and acoustic pollution. And if you look at the ship strikes uh, records uh, registered over the last few years, most of them are within the central Mediterranean Sea. And that blue border that you see between Corsica and the mainland of Italy, France, and the Monaco Principality are actually the borders or a marine protected area. So this is where fin whales should be protected. And this is actually where most of the collision occurs. So there is something which, uh, which doesn't, really, doesn't really work. We analyzed uh, about 287 uh, carcasses, animals stranded on the beach and 16% were certainly killed by boats. And this percentage rises to almost 20% if records including animals which are presumably killed by vessels or unidentified species are considered. 83% almost 
are within uh, the Pelago Sanctuary, this large uh, MPA. And also, if you look at uh, photo identified animals, these are live animals which are photographed by the boats. We have about nine animals, uh, which is a, a very small percentage, which present uh, ship strike. Uh, the, the picture you see here on the bottom is a sperm whale with some evidence of a propeller of a boat cutting the body of, of the animal. And this low percentage among photo identified whales means that most of the whales do not survive a ship strike, but they, they most likely die. And most vessels operators do not see the whale before it is struck. Look at this picture. This is a huge container with the cargos and a container ship. And you can see there is a whale, there is a blow on another whale. And most likely the captain or the crew have not seen this. If there is a ship strike, most of the time they realize that they have a whale on the bow when they enter in the port, they slow down and the whale get out of the bulbous in the front of the bow. A recent project that we made aimed to collect information from live and dead animals at the Mediterranean level by checking different national stranding networks and different photo identification catalogs to try to provide indication and uh, update the information on uh, stranding records and on the animals uh, that stranded because uh, of a ship strike. And here you can see some uh, some numbers that are 15% of whales and the lower percentage in uh, sperm whales stranding events. Uh, it, it was said before that most uh, animals uh, who are uh, killed by a ship strike uh, are unnoticed. There is a huge uh, degree of underreporting. So these are most likely underestimates of the real situation, because if an animal is caught in the middle of the sea, the animal may sink and it will never come out to the beach. So we will not be able to provide any, any information. These are just some graphical uh, configuration. The total strandings in blue for uh, sperm whales on the bottom and fin whales on the top. And then you can see over the last uh, 30 years, uh, how the situation has uh, changed. And you can see that there is a slight decrease uh, in the number of ship strikes for fin whales, as it's seen on top here, which is indicative that maybe the number of ship strikes is uh, decreasing. And this is probably related to the fact that ferries and the fast ferries are going a little slower with the fuel cost increasing and the cost of uh, moving a ship at a certain speed. Now many passenger vessels are reducing their speed because of cost. And so this is actually playing in favor of reducing ship strikes. And we did a little bit of statistics and there actually seems to be a decrease between 2010 and 2018 in the numbers of fin whales observed on the beach with evidence of ship strikes. We don't have any enough data for sperm whales to calculate a statistical like this, but we are afraid that they are also at risk by the, by the presence of increasing number of ships. Something to remember is that fin whales concentrate in the Ligurian Sea during the summer because this is when they come to the Ligurian Sea for feeding purposes. So they concentrate in the Ligurian Sea and this is when traffic and in particular passenger passenger ferries between the islands and the main coast are increasing in number so we have a lot of whales and a lot of traffic and therefore the risk of ship strikes increasing there are possible mitigation measures there are several reducing ship speed when crossing through high density areas coupled with visual observers that indicate the presence of a whale to the crew is always a very useful uh, mitigation tool. Yearly monitoring of whale presence and distribution to suggest uh, moving ferry routes uh, from areas of particular concentration to areas of lower density. Again, this would reduce uh, the risk of ship strikes uh, and also having uh, real time reporting tools uh, to alert uh, ships uh, of whales in a specific area can facilitate to increase uh, attention and care and to, and to reduce. As I said, this is a problem which is uh, worldwide and the International Rally Commission is collecting data all over the, the seas of the world to try to 
quantify the number of ship strikes uh, and uh, with uh, a project that we have been dealing uh, with uh, important marine mammal areas we are trying to overlap uh, areas which are important for cetaceans which areas which are characterized by high traffic levels and try to see whether we can uh, suggest uh, dedicated and uh, appropriate mitigation measures in these uh, in these areas and this is the result of an, a workshop which was organized in 2016 and it was replicated a couple of years later this is an area the borders in blue are what we have defined as an important marine mammal areas in red you see the trucks of the cargo and container ships and in purple you see the distribution of fin whales so there is a huge overlap between the presence of whales and the presence of ships and this of course increases the likelihood of getting a ship strike this is a similar exercise but this is done with the sperm whales and you can see the distribution is slightly different they tend to be closer to shore for example between mainland of italy there is a like a, a very dense uh, traffic uh, area here with cargos and again the risk of ship strikes with sperm whales and cargo increases a lot in this area where the two threats overlap. Getting close to the conclusion of my presentation, so we can have a little bit of question and discussion and move to the next speaker. One potential solution is to designate a PSSA by the International Whaling Commission. These are particularly sensitive sea areas where traffic can be regulated you can suggest to reduce the speed you can suggest to avoid specific areas which are characterized by high concentration of uh, sperm or fin whales or you can suggest uh, the cold uh, routing measures so if there is uh, an international framework such as the IMO telling uh, ships captain what to do we could uh, come to a reduction and to the implementation of proper conservation uh, measures. Thank you very much and I will be available for further questions. Thank you very much Simone and uh, uh, while I passing to my short presentation I just want to uh, start uh, one of the polls. Uh, the question is uh, the question is today um, <coughs> I'm just trying to get back to it. Uh, what is the main difference between Odontocetti and Misticetti? Uh, and uh, I'm not a scientist, so I don't even know the, the, the answer, but uh, uh, you can choose among these ones to see if uh, you got the message from uh, the previous uh, presentations. And in the meanwhile, I launch, I take the opportunity to launch also the other poll, which asks uh, which of the following species is most at risk of extinction. So have fun and we'll see the results at the end if you follow the, all the information that we passed through. So about uh, whale ship strikes at the global level. So I suppose you can see my presentation. Uh, eventually, please let me know if you cannot. Uh, so, uh, the problem with whale ship strikes. The problem is that the as we have seen also from some of the other speakers uh, and Simone, a uh, global shipping industry has has doubled every ten years, and um, um, there's an increasing number of vessels in our oceans. In in the past century, the number has doubled every decade. Uh, as well, uh, we have seen that. Uh, 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 shipping vessels' average speed has increased to become three times faster than whale speed on average. And also, Friendly Sea has carried out an, an extrapolation uh, study based on available literature and that has concluded that uh, on average, approximately 20,000 whales are killed every year by ship strikes. And this uh, dwarfs the number of whales killed by whaling itself. And is likely the same number of whales killed by entanglement in uh, fishing gears. It is clear that this can be a major risk of extinction, at least uh, of the most endangered whale species, which are represented, as we have seen from Roberto, uh, only by a few hundred individuals. Uh, furthermore, uh, there is a silent impact on uh, whales' migrations. Whale, whales migrate to feed and reproduce, 
and shipping lanes in particular in smaller seas like the Mediterranean and the Caribbean can make their migration much more complex in terms of energy waste and time to get to the right spot. And uh, a very clear example in this sense is, is provided uh, by this tracking of a blue whale in the Ch Chilean uh, Patagonian area frequently crossed by shipping vessel. I would just uh, show you just a little bit of this uh, video, which is also available on the website. You see the blue whale in blue is that little spot trying to move around and uh, being forced to uh, bounce back like a flipper uh, by the presence of uh, uh, shipping lanes. And obviously this uh, creates problems for migration, for feeding, for reproduction and so on. So let me see if I can move to the next slide. Somehow. Okay, I think I should go like uh, this way. We force it. So um, there are many identified high risk areas with high numbers of whales and high concentrations of vessels. Here you see some of the main ones. And um, the most effective uh, way to reduce the risk of ship strikes is to ensure that ships cannot encounter whales by separating them in time and space. Uh, measures to keep uh, ships away from whales can fall into different categories depending on whether they are permanent, seasonal or dynamic, and whether they are voluntary or mandatory. Voluntary measures can be encouraged and adopted by the shipping industry through certification schemes or port authorities wishing to encourage best practice in their spheres of influence. They can also be promoted by national governments or uh, IG IGOs like uh, the IMO. And this is actually happening in uh, in, uh, in some areas, but very rarely. Uh, more often, if ships cannot uh, be kept away from whales, uh, reducing their speed can reduce the risk of ship strikes. Studies have demonstrated that reducing speed to 10 knots or slower can reduce the risk of a little ship strike up to 50% or more. Several slow down areas are in place in North America, in Oceania, and uh, in a few other places around the globe. Uh, there, are, there has been much interest in uh, developing real-time whale detection technologies so that vessels can avoid areas where whale sightings have been made or engage in avoidance uh, maneuvers. These measures are based on the assumption that uh, vessels could alter their course of speed in time to avoid interaction with the whales, an assumption that uh, may be flawed in the case of vessels of several thousand gross tonnage and whales that may continue moving in unpredictable directions after they are first detected. There is evidence uh, that uh, uh, the front of the shipping vessels uh, represents a quiet sector in which whales do not perceive the incoming vessel. And however, acoustic deterrents, unfortunately, seem to lead whales to the surface and thus even potentially increase the risk of ship strikes. Our Friend of the Sea program calls on the international maritime sector to act immediately to prevent ship to whale -well collisions. Shipping companies, which uh, would comply with the minimum set of measures, uh, will be awarded the whale safe certification, which will in turn help their customers and consumers recognize their efforts to protect whales and make a responsible choice. The measures that uh, companies have to implement to be whale safe include a full-time marine mammal observation program on board, on all vessels such as infrared camera system, a procedure to react and avoid nearby marine mammals, whale observation sharing in real time with an online platform. Uh, Friendly Sea promotes the shipping companies and cruise lines approved and awarded by the Whale Safe Certification Seal among consumers and companies around the world, recommending the use of their services. We believe that, like other similar certifications, such as the Dolphin Safe, the Turtle Safe, and Friend of the Sea, the West Safe certification can help achieve tangible conservation results. Friend of the Sea has raised awareness about the issue of uh, whale ship strikes to motivate all to reduce this risk. Several media worldwide have mentioned the project. And this in itself is an important result as we are starting to make consumers and companies more aware of the issue. 
based on what has been uh, demonstrated during the certification of sustainability in dolphin and whale watching activities, and for the good conduct in the protection of the cetaceans, the following operators have been recognized as whale safe, friend of the sea, among uh, the reasons that have led us to reward these operators in the whale and dolphin watching uh, sector. There are maximum number of vessels in watching zone, maintaining an acceptable approach distance with cetaceans, Boats keep a slow and constant no weight speed. In order to motivate uh, shipping and cruise lines uh, to comply with existing slowdown regulations and rapidly introduce onboard systems to further reduce the risk of ship strikes, Friend of the Sea has carried out a study to analyze and rank ship shipping and cruise lines over the years in their engagement to reduce whale ship strikes. Data is being collected from companies' websites, sustainability reports, and direct contact with the sustainability managers when available. Companies have been ranked based on their level of engagement, compliance with slowdown areas, initiatives to reduce noise pollution, onboard full-time observation programs, and appropriate reporting. And uh, this ranking will change over time, so I suggest you also go and check our website. And uh, WSO and Friend of the Sea are glad to announce Hapagloid uh, for the Friend of the Sea Way Safe Award 2022 among the shipping lines. In recognition of the company's commitment uh, to reduce the risk of uh, way ship strikes, having Hapagloid scored best and entered the green area, which confirms compliance with our certification requirements. It is my honor thus to hand out, even though virtually, uh, the award to Captain uh, Gunther Mann, Director of Regulatory Affairs uh, in representation of Hapag Lloyd. And uh, we hope next year we will be able to award more companies. And this would mean that we will have generated uh, together some changes to tackle this important issue. And thank you very much. Now I will stop my uh, sharing and I will uh, pass the microphone to uh, Captain Guntermar. Guntermann. Thank you very much indeed for your kind words. Uh, we are really truly honored to receive this uh, reward, this recognition for our efforts, which we must say go over more than two decades. No, thank you for having me. Thank you for the invitation. I'm truly honored. And if I guess your time allows to walk through a presentation, if you don't mind, may I introduce myself? I'm Captain Wolfram Guntermann. I'm the Director of Regulatory Affairs in Habak Lloyd AG. Uh, my sailing career began recently in 1979. I have a master's and an engineer's license which allowed us to sail as ship operation officer or dual license. Um, officers, I've sailed as master on several Hapag-Lloyd vessels, but I was, how shall I say, stranded ashore in 1999 and I had assignments and position ashore in London, New York, and finally Hamburg. Hapag Lloyd, uh, in brevity, uh, well, 170 year, 75 years, the birthday is approaching in June. So since nearly 175 years, we move goods, connect countries, markets, and people. We are about 14,000 experts in six, global regions, 130 countries, and not to forget our seafarers at sea. So it's quite a mixed um, breed. We have employees from more than 100 nations and calling worldwide over 600 uh, ports. The headquarters based in Hamburg, where we have wow, today quite breezy conditions and high water. We are the fifth largest container liner in the world with right now 257 ships. And let me have a quick look to the sustainability. The sustainability is uh, actually a, a very important um, 
element where we have uh, to strengthen our sustainability contribution step by step and reduce the negative impact on, on the eco uh, systems. Uh, we have defined goals and measures for eight focus topics for the next 10 years. So some of the goals have already been quantified, others are still in the process of being further specified in the upcoming couple of months. So the eight focus topics are clustered into three areas. Firstly, and that's the top topic all around us on clean shipping, future-proof propulsion, where greenhouse gases, clean air, and sustainable supply chains play a significant role. Our strategic focus is certainly on greenhouse gas emissions and their reductions. We want to show our path to decarbonization and our goal to be clean, climate neutral is actually by 2045. The second key area is diversity and the society. We want to make progress in the area of diversity, benefit from having a diverse workforce. We will also continue to strengthen our role in the area of corporate citizenships and define very precisely where we will intensify our efforts related to social commitment. A third focus, and that's the focus where we are coming in my presentation, is the area of compliance and responsibility, which covers resource conservation, transport care, and biodiversity. This includes, for example, the well-being of our yeah, crews, cargoes, the environment, as well as our impact on the biodiversity of oceans and marine animals. And the marine animals, we are coming. Let us first take a hop westbound across the North Atlantic. The North Atlantic right well population was actually my first encounter uh, when I took my assignment in Upper Cloyd, America in 1999, and actually in Piscataway, New Jersey, close to New York. So we were engaged with local meetings, local meetings, public hearings in Boston, Massachusetts, Washington, D.C. That started at the beginning of the decade. It's now, yeah, it's more than 20 years ago. So in the lead, you all know them, NOAA, Fisheries, National Ocean and Atmospheric Organization. They were in the preparation to issue a rule on contemporary speed reductions and ATBAs, areas to be avoided. And we participated with shipping associations, New York Shipping Association, World Shipping Council, and we, we engaged in really constructive and interesting meetings. And uh, I, I had just left the ship and uh, we, we, I remember as it would have been a couple of weeks ago, we were said, yeah, well, you have to be a prudent mariner, you have to be on the lookout and watch out for spouts and say, yeah, well, I've seen spouts and I've enjoyed that very much indeed. However, say, let's take the summer months in the North Atlantic with a visibility where I cannot see the foremast from the bridge. How on earth shall I detect a spout? And as I said, the, the, the discussions were constructive and it, it, it really led to the system of ATBAs, areas to be avoided, plus a speed reduction uh, in certain areas. Where I still have difficulties to understand why government vessels, say like the US Coast Guard and the Navy, remain still exempted from the regulation. So while we as commercial ship owners and operators are driving carefully, they can still run on full blast, which is okay. It is what it is. Right, another aspect in this regulation where the vessels have to travel at 10 knots or less in certain locations, that is the seasonal, seasonal management areas. Uh, 
starting in the northeast of the North American continent and the Mid-Atlantic. Mid-Atlantic, that's the area, Norfolk, Wilmington, North Carolina, where, where you find migratory route and calving grounds and from November to April. So you have vessel routing recommendations to reduce possible collisions with North Atlantic right whales. The voluntary seasonal ATBA, which is in effect each year from about April to July, when the right whales fail, is actually the highest risk of ship strikes in this area. What has been also implemented, a mandatory ship reporting system. When ships are entering the key right whale habitats, they have to report to a shore-based station and in return ships will receive messages about the presence of right whales, locations and recent sightings. Let's hop from the right coast to the left coast, as they say in the US and in North America. That brings us to the beautiful state of California. You see a map on the very right you see the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach and the Santa Barbara Channel. In the Santa Barbara Channel uh, in 2016, a vessel speed reduction incentive-based program was launched for the very first time. And let's start with the geography. If you have a look at the right, you, you see Los Angeles Long Beach with concentric circles, one in, in violet, that's a 20 nautical mile diameter, and another circle with light magenta, that's a 40 nautical miles. And that's, I'm coming to that, is actually not related to whale protection programs, but to the situation of clean air. The geographic location of the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach is actually, the, the cities are located in valleys surrounded by beautiful mountains. However, that's very difficult with regards to air quality. In the late 90s, there was really a, in, an increase of respiratory illness. Air quality was very poor and that triggered really the situation to implement a voluntary speed reduction program for the ships, which, and it's the famous carrot and stick, which was rewarded by lowering port use to be paid. There is actually a high compliance. And while I am in Los Angeles, Long Beach, another very important factor was the implementation uh, of onshore power supply, which means the vessels are switching off their auxiliary engines while in port and take the power from the municipal grid. Let's hop further west. So again, the light magenta circle, including Catalina Islands, but then the Santa Barbara Channel, where the program uh, is now actually conducted annually. Uh, it was developed and implemented by, let me read the long names, Santa Barbara County Air Pollution Control District, Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, and the Environmental Defense Center. So when, when the program was presented, we said, ah, well, it's not just about whales, it's also about air quality, isn't it? And say, yeah, yeah, of course it is. It is also about air quality. So this, these are the famous process of catching two flies with one flap. And it, it was modeled after the successful speed reduction program in the major ports where, oh, that's true, where more than 90% of the shipping lines are participating. So that the participation resulted in a very positive response by Californian government agencies and the media. And as we are deeply involved in, in IMO, MEPC, the Marine Environmental Protection Committee, 
We are certainly having a look at the submission from a recent one, 72 slash 16 slash 5 by Canada. And Canada was actually referring to noise emission measurements conducted in the Santa Barbara uh, channel since 2008. Absolutely thrilling news. We, uh, the situation is we weren't aware about it. However, we are certainly aware that if, if you are going to do modifications on the hydrodynamic characteristics of the ship and your propeller, that this is going to result in improved noise emissions of the vessels. So we are very happy that we actually did achieve the highest ranking with a sapphire with 87%, which is outstanding. And in light of the COVID pandemic situation, especially for our seafarers, we decided to donate the monies to the Siemens mission because they did a gorgeous job during the pandemic with, with assisting the seafarers, telephone cards, buying necessary things and so forth. So it, we really scratched our head, shall we, shall we re return it? Or, but the, I, I think the Siemens mission was also a very good decision. So let's take that more under corporate social responsibility. And shall we go further west? Yes, northwest exactly to the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority's ECHO program. And the Harrow Street, Harrow Street much uh, shorter leg than the Santa Barbara channel. And the participation in the Harrow Street slowdown trial, that was aimed to study the impact of underwater acoustic uh, disturbance actually on the orca whale population. Well, I, I guess I don't have to explain to you uh, orca whales, but when I'm giving a presentation on, on, on whale protection, say to a young group of apprentices just joining Apacloid and said, well, do you remember the movie Free Willy? And oh yeah, that's an orca whale. Oh, right, always try to make the connections. The, the trail ran for the first time in 2017 between August and October. Now it's actually extended. The purpose was to maintain a speed of 11 knots through the water uh, over the entire trial distance. And we got great help from, from the port and the pilots, actually. The pilot on board will also have access to the coordinates uh, on this pilotage unit. And again, we are repeating it successfully on an annual basis. And it's a, it's a matter of communication. One, once you have communicated it to the ship commands, to the masters, and maybe you just do an additional remark in the schedule and the folks running the schedules from the shore side, well, you can run the calculation in advance. And, and actually, in the end of the day, the stretch of the um, Harrow Strait is not that far. So from the Harrow Strait, let's cross the Pacific Ocean, going west, going west, going west, until we are reaching the Indian Ocean, south of the beautiful island of uh, Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka has this remarkable situation south of Dondra Head. Dondra Head was actually one of the first traffic separation schemes. What is a traffic separation scheme? You, you see the magenta colored rectangular um, uh, shapes and between the rectangulars, you have a westbound facing arrow. So that's supposed where the vessels have to use the corridor once they are going westbound. And further south, it's the eastbound lane when you are running towards the Malacca Strait in Singapore. So it is like, uh, it's like the median on the highway. Don't cross it. You should not cross it. Actually, that 
traffic separation scheme was implemented in 1980 when I was still sailing on general cargo ships going to Indonesia. But uh, I'm not telling stories from the sea, don't be afraid. Uh, no, I'm talking about blue whales. It is actually, and if you try to have a closer look, unfortunately, the traffic separation scheme is just at the edge of the shelf. And the shelf, as you know as expert, is the feeding area for the blue whales and certainly other fish. And you have really uh, the situation of whales and there's also other fish, of course, at the shelf and a high amount of fishery crafts. And last but not least, uh, with the tourism whale watching boats as well. So the World Shipping Council, where about 90% of all container carriers and car carriers are members and they have uh, also accreditation at the IMO, it was an initiative to write a letter to the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka in 2017. The purpose was we are concerned about possible whale strikes against blue whales. And actually, we ran a workshop with the um, World Shipping Council participation, IMO, other stakeholders. The workshop was held in uh, Colombo in December 2018, and we were making our case. The case was well, take action. Just move, make an application to IMO, and please move the traffic separation scheme about 15 nautical miles further to the south. Why? Because it's then deep water, there's no shelf, there are no hungry blue whales feeding, and there are no other fish, etc. And from the nautical point of view, it is a negligible deviation if you are running from the Gulf of Aden to the Malacca Straits and vice versa. So it would have been really a great windfall. Unfortunately, and this uh, where I have difficulties of, to understand, there, there was uh, quite a reluctance. The stakeholders were asking, yeah, if you have a deviation, you will not call the port of Colombo anymore, right? As I said, well, we have uh, weekly services. Why shouldn't? Why should we skip the calling the port of Colombo? No way. And um, it is a slow political process, and I, I it's, it's not up to me to to comment on the individual nations how they are running their business. But uh, as a side note. We had the workshop in December 2018, and on Easter Sunday 2019, there was a terror attack in Colombo, actually the, on the hotel where we had our meetings. And well, that, that, that slows down the political process in general. Uh, but we, we are not giving up. We, we had meetings in the embassy of Sri Lanka in, in London. We are considering to have other meetings, embassy in Berlin, and maybe another workshop that we really push and to advise to run this uh, exercise to move the traffic separation scheme a little bit further south of Dondra Head. So this brings me to the end of my afternoon presentation. Thank you very much indeed for your kind attention and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Captain, and thank you to all the speakers. We have been presenting for more than one hour now, but uh, the information that uh, I think we delivered was uh, very useful uh, and also comprehensive. I will uh, have a quick look uh, to the poll's result and uh, I will need the feedback also from the scientists. Uh, uh, what was the, the, the right answer uh, in terms of the difference between Odontoceti and Mysticeti? Presence of teeth or baleen? 
Is that that's right? right? Yeah, that's right. The first one was the easiest one. Okay. I want to see the second one that it was some it was more difficult. Which one of the following species is most at risk? North Atlantic right whale? Was that this right? Is right. Yes. Yeah. The other ones also have some level of risk, right? Oh. Exactly, yeah. But the North Atlantic right whale the is the critically most endangered. critically endangered species. Okay, great. Good to know. So now we have some questions. I think I will start from uh, the one to Apagloid. We don't have many questions, probably because we already provided so much information. <laughs> anyway, because uh, I know that the uh, captain is, is a bit on, the, on a rush. So um, what can Apagloid do to further improve its effort to prevent uh, whale ship strikes? Uh, Yes, if you can provide an answer to this, uh, I know it's quite, uh, you, you've done already quite a lot, but maybe there's more that can be done. I would be happy if I would be sitting here at my writing desk in, in the home office at 1606 and have an idea right away. I would share it with the company and say, oh, I just got an idea. No, uh, I, I think Without tapping on my shoulder, we did quite well. And thanks again for recognizing that to, to Paolo and his organization. That doesn't mean that we have, uh, should get complacent. No, not at all. The, the journey isn't over. We have to continue. We have to work hard with the stakeholders and try to find further solutions. With a remark with regards to, to Simona's interesting presentation, which which struck my head. Uh, you make a reference to the high speeds, and you are right. When 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 I was still sailing as a captain in 1999, that was the London Express. That ship was running 24 knots. So this was. This was the business model. The ships had to be very fast. The cargo had to be delivered fast because the customers would be allegedly paying for it. Well, then came 2008. Habakloid was among the first lines introducing slow steaming. Slow steaming, nobody is um, on the left lane on the autostrada or the autobahn anymore, speeding with 24 knots. So. The, the, the speed band was reduced by six, seven, eight knots. So 16 knots is more or less the new normal for the long legs or even, or even slower. Because, well, energy prices are, well, right now, still further increasing and going through the roof. So I maybe that that's an element which has helped and will uh, further continue uh, to help really to, to get this top speed range out of the brains. Thank you very much, Captain. And so uh, for uh, Dr. Panegada, um, can reduction in uh, ship strikes in the Mediterranean be due to reduction in populations of the whales? What is the likely trend of whales population numbers in the Mediterranean Sea according to the data that is available? I, I know it's not an easy answer, but or an easy question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Paolo. No, I, I don't think uh, the reduced number of ship strikes can be related to a reduce in population. The population is uh, probably slightly decreasing, but as you said, it's very difficult to estimate, uh, first of all, the estimate population and to have enough data to think about trends. Uh, we made an exercise in uh, 2018 uh, to have an average uh, population abundance for the MED uh, and uh, the next uh, large scale survey is probably going to happen in five years, uh, depending on the funding we will uh, be able to secure. So right now we cannot really say if uh, the population is uh, increasing or decreasing. We may infer some uh, slightly negative trends uh, due to anthropogenic mortality, ship strikes being uh, one of them. But I, I don't think we can really say that the population has decreased uh, and therefore the number of ship strikes has decreased. I, I think uh, 
the captain uh, mentioned uh, that very clearly there is a tendency in uh, reducing uh, the speed uh, at some uh, level at, at some degree mm -hmm. which is playing uh, in favor of uh, of ship strikes so mm -hmm. maybe in the future you know we are going to go to carbon neutral the economy is uh, probably not as uh, fertile as it used to be in the past uh, fuel uh, cost is increasing so we may get yeah. to some uh, sort of first and major uh, causes uh, to reduce uh, the speed uh, without as uh, scientists and conservationists uh, pushing the leg too much uh, to captains and to ferry companies mm -hmm. and all those companies thank you very much uh, another question for Apagloid. Uh, whale seeker is a company in montreal using ethical artificial intelligence to develop wave detection tools from imagery uh, what would an ideal whale detection solution look like from a captain's point of view thank you an ideal whale detection solution like infrared camera or something like that you talked about a situation where fog does not allow you to I, I I'm not aware about uh, the, the provider, but it's uh, certainly uh, worth to 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 explore it and, and and have a test whether whether it's working. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, but I'm not not I'm I'm not aware. And uh, is is it based? If it's based on an infrared heat detection, yeah. It depends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. there are combinations. Uh, you can actually see whales uh, from uh, high definition uh, satellites, uh, but you mm -hmm. need uh, a very clear, <clears throat> clear coverage. Uh, you need a very good weather, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a combination of factors. But there are tools, uh, and uh, there will be tools uh, in the future. Yeah, which will that's good. I know. Facilitate, uh, mm -hmm. assessing the presence of whales. Uh, we are just not there yet, but. It's just a matter of time, I guess. <laughs> yeah, probably. Okay, wonderful. So we have no more questions. Now there is one, uh, Paolo, oh, yes. actually, by yes. my good friend uh, Nikki on uh, on the chat. And the question is, uh, what can uh, the shipping companies do politically in support uh, of the PSSA proposal? The PSSA proposal is uh, voted uh, by the members of the IMO. So if shipping companies uh, support uh, this, uh, they, of course, have a strong uh, influence at the IMO. And what shipping companies can do is lobbying in order to make sure that when uh, the proposal will be discussed and voted, uh, there are votes in uh, favor. So having the support uh, of shipping companies, of course, uh, would be very, very helpful. And having Wolfram on board uh, with Apagloid, of course, uh, would be a, a big uh, asset uh, into this as well. And that that's that's correct. And you you never give up the hope. Being based in Germany, that would be the national, the German flag. And mm -hmm. and we as Apagloid, we don't have a seat at IMO, but the, the 175 member nations have a seat, and they are voting. And as you have followed the recent debates at uh, MEPC. Uh, virtual meetings, they were really compressed to three hours only and really remarkable, not just three hours, it was held in 24 time zones around and, and the chairman Saito-san was sitting in the ministry in Tokyo and chairing that meeting, which usually should have been held in IMO as a present meeting face to face. So. Um, well, I think we don't want to talk about the disease which it has <laughs> the last two years, but I'm, I'm convinced everybody is looking forward to meet uh, real people in real meetings in, in the very near future, hopefully. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. So if there are no more comments uh, from the speakers, I no. really... I wish to thank you all for uh, your contribution to the to the webinar. It will be video recorded and uh, available uh, for more to listen to. I think it's very useful in general to raise awareness and provide scientific data like we have done today. 
Thank you again, uh, everybody, for participating and also among the audience. And uh, I hope to see you again, maybe tomorrow, for a, a more, um, let's say, lightweight uh, uh, webinar about uh, fashion, even though there are some issues with uh, fashion too that have to be tackled in terms of environmental and social. So that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow. For the time being, I wish you all a pleasant rest, a great rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. It was great having Thank us. You Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Subscribe to our channel to get more content about sustainability.